It's uh, always a joy for us to see you here on Sunday mornings. Uh, we're looking forward to a good day together this morning as we continue on through the book of Revelation. I still haven't received any clear direction from the Lord yet as to how long I need to continue in Revelation. What I'm finding is that as I go chapter by chapter, I, I'm seeing things that kind of prompts me to go ahead and continue into the next chapter. I said I was going to stop at chapter 5. I can't stop at chapter 5 without going into chapter 6. So uh, unless the Lord changes my direction, we're going to continue on in that direction. Would you take your Bibles this morning and turn with me into Revelation chapter 5? And I want to share some verses with you this morning. I'm not certain that I'm going to read the entire chapter, although we're actually looking at the entire chapter this morning. I think we're just going to go through verse 8. So if you all will stand and follow along with me, uh, we'll share Revelations chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 8. This is what John writes. He says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a scroll written inside uh, and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the, uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne uh, of four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, I'm going to continue on, and have made uh, uh, us kings and priests of our God, and we shall reign on earth. Let's join together as we pray this morning as we continue on. Father, we're so grateful for the, this new day that you've given to us and this new opportunity to come together and to uh, uh, lift our voices up and sing, to uh, study your word in the time of Sunday school. Uh, to uh, uh, hear a, uh, a great children's time, one that I know reaches into the hearts of these young ones, and that's important. And now, Father, as we open your word together, I pray that uh, uh, you'll help me today to be found faithful in the study of your word and to uh, bring the message that, that you've spoken into my heart, that we might all be changed as a result of being here today. We have so many things to look forward to in Christ, Father, and, and so many things in this great book uh, for us to look at and not to be afraid of. So we pray your blessings on this ta time now. We thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for loving us and caring for us in the way you do. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, beloved, so far in our journey into Revelation, uh, it's, I think it's been wonderful. I love studying the book. I can't study it enough. I find myself going back to it verse by verse and chapter by chapter uh, on a regular basis kind of like a quick review of where we have come from and where we're going. Uh, in the first uh, and second chapter, Jesus uh, appears to John as he is today, as we uh, one day will see him now. That's how he appears to John. And, uh, and after that, we find him standing in the midst of his church, uh, watching his church, watching over the things that are taking place. Uh, in chapter 4, verse 1, uh, we saw John as uh, uh, he was caught up into heaven, and, uh, and as soon as he got there, he was shown the things that were yet to come, the things that were to happen. It, remember, that started the third division in the uh, book of Revelation, and it has to do with future things. Everything from chapter 4 forward uh, has everything in the world to do with things that haven't taken place yet, but are going to take place. And then in uh, verses 2-11 through 11 of chapter 4, John gave us a wonderful glimpse of glory. And, and oh, I, how I love to preach uh, of heaven. Uh, I've, uh, I've had two funerals in the last week, and it gave me the opportunity in both instances to preach about the wonders of heaven. 
and how great that's going to be. And I look, so look forward to the day that all of us will begin there. So as we begin chapter uh, 5, uh, we find the apostles uh, still standing in uh, the throne room, standing there uh, as if he is waiting for uh, something to happen, and surely it does. Because the next thing, if you notice in the scripture, the next thing that catches the attention of John is a seven-scrolled or a seven-sealed scroll that is in the hand of the heavenly Father. And in verse one, we read, John says, "And I saw." And this is important the way he worded this. He said, "And I saw in the right hand of him who was on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals." Now, looking back at the focus of chapter 4, the focus of chapter 4 was the throne and the one who is seated on the throne. The focus of chapter 5 is the scroll, where it is at, and who is found in heaven who is worthy to open the scroll. That's the entire fifth chapter. Well, there is a sure reason why John notes the position of this scroll. He said it is in the right hand of the Heavenly Father. The reason that's important is because every Jew, every Jewish man and every Jewish woman would have understood the significance of that scroll being in the right hand of the Heavenly Father. The right hand of God throughout the Scripture is a symbol of His strength and His, just, His uh, justice. We see it time and time again in the Word of God. Let me give you one example. In Exodus 15, 6, we can, we can read this. It says, Thy right hand, O Lord is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. But the meaning of it does not stop there because it carried on even into the lives of the Jewish people. Really, in some respects, it carries on into our life today. You ever heard the term, my right hand man? Or my right hand woman? We still use the term today. And sometimes we use it and we're not even sure why we use it. Well, it, it most likely comes from the ancient world. The Jews not only used this, but also the pagan nations used this terminology. But in reference to the Bible, every reference of the, of the right hand that we find in the Bible, which I believe that there's over 200 of them, uh, I didn't get an exact count, but I think I'm close, but in all of the references to the right hand, we find it being the impartation of favor and strength and power from the one whose right hand is placed out, welcoming the other in. Now the Old Testament, uh, there's a couple of different occasions in the Old Testament where uh, uh, it was customary when a father would take his eldest son, his firstborn son, he would take him and he would lay his right hand upon the head of his oldest son and impart unto him the blessing. He would pass the blessing onto him. There are several references to that that are found in the uh, Old Testament. Uh, kings and leaders in that time, I've read different examples where they would always seat uh, a person lesser than them, maybe the queen or some other leader, they would seat them to their right hand. And if a king would, uh, was welcoming someone in, he was said to extend his right hand to them, indicating that they had access to his uh, throne. Uh, all three writers of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of them, uh, recorded Psalm 110, verse 1, where it says this. It says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool. I told somebody last Sunday, I may have told you this before, but I like repeating this. I told last somebody last, uh, someone last Sunday that this verse of Scripture proves that God was left-handed because Jesus was sitting on his right hand. I'm lefty, and so, uh, so I, I, like, I like repeating that. That may be of use to you, and it may not, but that's okay. It, it's, it, it's not going to cost anything extra. This, uh, this proclamation of God the Father uh, to the Son it was a pro proclamation that uh, God promised him, you're going to sit on my right hand and you're going to remain on my right hand. And we know the Bible says that he's seated at the right hand of the Father now. He's interceding for us. He's interceding for us today. And God said, God promised him, he proclaimed, you're going to sit on my right hand and you're going to remain there until your enemies are under your feet. Your, your enemies become your footstool uh, in complete subjection to you. That's what we see beginning to take place in Revelation. We begin, we're beginning to see that prophecy being fulfilled. Uh, in Hebrews 1.3, it says that Jesus himself 
purged our sins, and after he had done that, that he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And beloved, that's where he's at today. Eleven different times in the New Testament books, it mentions Jesus as being seated at the right hand of God. Uh, but, but one of the things that I've noticed of Revelation, after all of those references, and that you're, you will notice, is as we enter into the fifth chapter of Revelation, Jesus is no longer seated. Which is, an, I hadn't really noticed this until I began to study this this week. He's no longer seated, and you'll not see him seated again through the remainder of the book. And the reason for that is he's standing up and he's getting ready for action. Because things are getting ready to take place. Well, having seen this scroll... Uh, in the right hand of the Father. John then goes on to kind of describe the scroll to us. He said, and written inside and out and on the back, uh, were seven, uh, uh, were, it was sealed with seven seals. Now, it's very likely that John knew exactly what this meant. And the reason I say that comes from ancient history. Uh, this was a description that John gave of, uh, of some kind of a legal document. Uh, in those days, uh, any time a legal document was written up, they would seal that doctor, document to protect it and to protect the contents uh, within it. Uh, the scroll that is described here is described as having seven seals. And you know, we've talked about this before, that uh, seven in the Bible is the number of perfection or completion. So as we look at this scroll, in all likelihood, uh, what we're seeing here is the beginning of God's final word on some things. And I really believe that's, uh, that's what's taking place here. Now, when we consider books in ancient times, they weren't like the books that we have today, where we flip one page after the other and look in the book. Books in those days were written on scrolls. They were long pieces of parchment that would be written on uh, one side or sometimes on both sides. They would be rolled up, and depending on the number of pages or how important the document was, each individual page would be written on, then rolled up and sealed. Then the next page would be laid over that and rolled up over the top of it and sealed and on and on, uh, depending on how important that document was. Well, we have here a scroll that it has seven seals on it. It's actually in one scroll, but there are seven seals. And we'll see this as we get into the sixth chapter, because you'll see that Jesus opens one seal at a time, and things occur after he opens that seal. Legal documents, uh, I, uh, you know, you can read up on this. It's all over the Old Testament. Legal documents would be written on both sides. Uh, the inside contained the details of what was taking place in that document, and the outside would be a written summary of what was contained on the insides. In other words, the outside would tell you what kind of document it was, how important it was, and who was authorized to open it. And that was the legal documents of that day. Now, the really amazing thing about this scroll, when you look at it and you consider it, uh, when we take the time, beloved, to think about this thing, the really amazing thing about this is that we have been privileged to be able to see what's inside this scroll. There are so many mysteries that are hidden from the world today, but God has nothing to hide from us. And I rejoice in the knowledge of that. God's not trying to keep something from me. He has opened this wide open for us to see. Let me give you a, a, a great example. I'm sure that most of you remember uh, the book of Daniel, a great prophetic book. In the book of Daniel, the entire book is, da is Daniel being shown many of the things that are, that are going to take place uh, in the end times, during the tribulation. Well, when Daniel completed the book in chapter 12, this is what God told him to do. He said, O oh, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. God instructed him to do that because things that were contained in that book, things that were sealed up in that book, people would not understand because the time wasn't right yet for it. But almost 600 years later, after Daniel, when John was on the Isle of Patmos and he was caught up into heaven, John was told in Revelation 22, he was told there, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And the reason why God told him not to seal them is because he said, because the time is at hand. What time is he talking about there? He's talking about the time that Daniel spoke about in his book. The time that God told him to seal up because the world was not ready. 
That's an indication that the world's ready. Amen? You know, there's been a lot of discussion about what kind of a legal document this scroll is, uh, what it will be. I've done a tremendous amount of study on this. I've read I don't know how many commentaries from, from writers back as far back as, as you can find commentaries. And one of the things that I've discovered is the vast majority of scholars unanimously agree that this scroll, what this scroll amounts to is the title deed to the earth. That that's really what it comes down to. To, to all that was lost when sin entered into the world and, uh, and man lost his first estate. And you know, to read about that, all you have to do is go back to Genesis chapter 1. Because in Genesis chapter 1, in particular in verse 26, God had made everything that He was going to make and had placed it on this earth. He, he created it all by speaking it into existence. After everything, He said, it is good. He proclaimed that it was good. And then in verse 26, God proclaimed this. He said, let us make man in our image. You can see the Trinity in that. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all of them had equal, uh, an equal place in the creation. He said, let, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and look at this, and let them have dominion. That meant tree, chief rulership. There would be no higher position on the earth than God had placed uh, in mankind. He said, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And God placed man, when he did that, he placed him in a perfect environment. He gave him rulership over all of his creation, but then sin entered into the picture. And because of sin, Adam lost his dominion and he was cursed. And Adam's fall into sin not only caused his descendants to suffer the consequences of the, of the curse, but all of creation throughout every generation has also suffered and will suffer till the day of redemption. I mean, that's why... The earth is in the way, is in the shape it's in today, is because of that curse of sin. Well, after man f fell into sin, it didn't take long for Satan to step in and, and, and wrongfully claim ownership of everything that was under the curse. And that's exactly what he did. Ephesians 6 tells us that he is the ruler of the darkness of this age. You know what the darkness of this age is? It's sin, my friends. It is the darkness of sin that is upon this earth and that affects the life of every man, woman, and child in this world and has since the day that Adam sinned and will until the day that the Lord Jesus Christ comes to put a stop to it. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 calls Him the God of this age. Jesus told His disciples that the devil has come to steal, to kill, and destroy. And that's what He's doing. And He's doing a good job of it. Amen? He's doing a good job of it. This scroll that is in the right hand of the Heavenly Father contains the steps that will be required to buy back the estate that was lost when Adam sinned. It's all written in here. You know, I've heard a lot of people blame Adam for the mess that we're in, but listen, we need to remind ourselves that the Scripture says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And it also says there is none righteous, no, not one. Listen, if Brother Pat would have been there on the day of creation, and God would have placed me in the garden and placed Quine in there with me, I still would have sinned. I still would have done it. Every one of us would. None of us can say we wouldn't have sinned. Not a one of us. So here in chapter 5, what we have is we have the call going forth throughout the heavens to see if there's anyone who's worthy to open these seven seals, this scroll that's in the right hand of the Father. Verse 2, John says, Then I saw a strong angel. Now, I don't know why it identifies him as a strong angel. Some have tried to guess who this strong angel is. Uh, I have a sneaking suspicion it could be Gabriel. It doesn't say that. The reason I say that is because in the Old Testament, the, the name Gabriel means uh, the strength of God. And Gabriel, uh, if you see all the occurrences in the Scripture where Gabriel is mentioned, it's always in reference to him delivering some kind of a message, bringing some kind of a word from God. I don't know that that's the case, but it could very possibly be. I'd like to think that it is Gabriel. I hope I get to meet him one day. John said, Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. 
And I want to tell you, when he, it says it was a loud voice here, it was a loud voice because all of the universe heard it. That's what it says here. And his proclamation was, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And it says, And no one, I have that underlined, And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll, the scroll or to look at it. No one in all the universe, not even this strong angel, could open this scroll. John's reaction. He said, so I wept much. You know, where there didn't seem to be any response from the angels calling out, it seems, it appears that John was overcome with emotion, maybe with fear, Maybe with uncertainty. Beloved, have you ever felt uncertainty in this world that you're living in? You see things taking place and going on, maybe some things that you're dealing with in your own life, and, you, and you, all you can do is weep because you don't know what's going to take place. You don't know what's going to happen. Man, we've all been there. Some are there now. But John was overwhelmed with this emotion. We've got to remember where John is. The physical body of John is still on the island of Patmos. But his spirit has been caught up to heaven. He was still in the present day and he was being shown something that was in the very far future. Something that he had no understanding of whatsoever. And so it says he wept. He sensed how important the contents of this book were. And he wept. It means that he sobbed continuously. It means to wail out loud is one of the translations. And the reason he did that is because it says no one was found. No one was found who was worthy to open and read the scroll or look at it. And verse 5, I like this part. It says, but one of the elders said to me, well, I, my first question as I studied this some time ago was, how did the elder know? It, this is kind of what I got to thinking about, and I thought, Lord, this is kind of like one of these back to the future things. <laughs> John is still in the current day, but he's looking at a future thing, and the future thing that he's looking at has individuals in it that are from the past. This elder was somewhere along the line. This one who came to John knew who was worthy to open that scroll. And so he came to comfort John. And it says, one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. You know, both of those descriptions are descriptions of the Lord Jesus. There's not any doubt about that. They're both descriptions of not only His human nature, but also His divine nature. And that takes away any question as to who has prevailed and who's worthy to loose this scroll and to redeem what was lost. I, and then I love the song. If you drop down into verse 9, I love the song that they sing in verse 9 that, that really says it all. In verse 9, they, they sing this song, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the scrolls thereof, for Thou hast, was slain and has redeemed us to God by Thy blood of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. That word redeemed is the key to the whole thing right there. It's the key. It's the key to understanding what John is describing here. And to understand that better, we have to go back and look at the laws of redemption that we find in the Old Testament. They're very clear there. The laws of redemption stated in the Old Testament, and you can find them all throughout the Old Testament. I'm going to give you a couple examples. When uh, a piece of property had been so, stole, uh, stolen or sold or confiscated through the power of another nation or lost through death or other means, a scroll was prepared for that family. And on the inside of that scroll was written all of the requirements and the details that were necessary for that property to one day be bought back. There were three requirements that were always necessary for the opening of one of these scrolls. Number one, it could only be bought back by a near kinsman, someone who was a blood relative of the original owners. Number two, the near kinsman had to be willing to pay whatever price was required to redeem that scroll. And number three, the near kinsman had to be willing to act. Let me give you a couple of great examples in the Old Testament. There's one example that's found in uh, Jeremiah chapter 30. Nebuchadnezzar is marching on Jerusalem. 
He's getting ready to take Israel. He's going to take them into captivity and lead them back into Babylon. God knows that this is going to happen, so he speaks to Jeremiah. He said, Jeremiah, I want you to go and buy this field, pay the price for this field and buy this field, write everything down on this document, roll it up, seal it, put it in a clay jar, take it to the leadership down on the square. And what this was to be was to be a reminder to God's people that they were going into captivity, but God was promising them, I'm going to bring you back to your land and you can redeem your land. That's exactly what that was saying. The clearest picture that we have, and one that I know we're all familiar with, is the story of Ruth and Boaz. We can read the account of that in the book of Ruth. It is, it's a wonderful story. I love the story. I love to read it. I, but I can only give you a summary of it because it's very detailed. It's the, it's the in, entire book. Uh, there was a man named Elimelech, you remember, and he and his wife Naomi, they, uh, uh, there was a great famine in the land, and they had, to, they had to leave their home and their land and go somewhere else so that they could survive. Uh, after many years went by, only uh, Naomi and her daughter-in-law Ruth were able to return to the land because everyone else in their family uh, had died. Uh, and so they returned to Bethlehem. Na Naomi immediately sets out to, uh, to find a, a near kinsman, she understands that, who would be willing to redeem their property uh, for them. Uh, so it says in Chapter 2, verse 1, it says, uh, Naomi had a kinsman, and his name was Boaz. Now, we're not going to go into all the details as to how Naomi was able to get Boaz to agree to be their kinsman re redeemer. I'll just say this, she was a pretty smart cookie. Because you read that story, it's, it's brilliant what the Lord led her to do to, uh, to win Boaz over, to win his heart. In any event, the story tells us that Boaz offered to do the part of kinsman redeemer, but before he could, there was actually another nearer kinsman who uh, should come first. So Boaz approached him and asked him, he said, if you'll not do this, I will. This other nearer kinsman said, I am unable to fulfill the requirements. I can't do it. So Boaz stepped up and, uh, and he offered to become their near kin kinsman because he was not only a relative, but he was able and willing to pay the price and he was wi willing to act on it, and he did. And you know from that line came Jesus Christ. Are you all aware of that? You know, from that example that we're given, we see a clear picture of Jesus. It's a... It's an undeniable, unquestionable picture. The Lord Jesus, my friends, is the only one in all of eternity, the only one, there's no other, who will be able to meet all of the requirements to open the scroll. And you know why? Because he's our near kinsman. He came to earth as a man and was in always tempted yet we, as we are yet without sin. Uh, but... He had to be God so that he'd be worthy to open the scroll, but he also had to be man so he could act on our behalf and be in our bloodline, the bloodline of man, and he was able to do that yet without sin. Secondly, he was willing to pay the price that was required. Acts 20, 28 tells us that Jesus purchased us with his own blood. Uh, right here in the text in verse 9, it says, You were slain and have purchased us uh, to God by your own blood. You see, Jesus has purchased us with His own blood. And what was lost in Adam is regained in Christ. And this scroll, this record that is going to be open, is one seal after the other will release one more thing at a time, bringing us back to, free, to, to complete redemption in Jesus Christ. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. And the last thing is that He was willing to act. And, you know, when Jesus was kneeling down in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night that he was betrayed, he bowed his head and, and so, said, Father, if you're willing, you can let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, Lord, whatever your will is, that's what I'll do. And that's what he did. He went to the cross for us. He never hesitated. Beloved, Jesus Christ is the only one in all of God's universe who's able to open this scroll and release, release the contents, redeeming all of those sold under sin. And every one of us here this morning are sold under sin. Setting us free from that. Setting us free from bondage to Satan. All, all have been purchased by his blood. And, and not only that, but bringing Satan's reign to an end and putting away death and sin forever. And I look forward to that day. Look forward to that day. There's one more thing as we close this morning. There's a, a verse here that I just can't pass up. A, one of my favorite 
theologians, a man named Theodore Epp. I don't know how many of you have heard of Theodore Epp. Theodore Epp, was a, he was a, one of the Back to the Bible teachers that used to be on the radio years ago. I think he also pastored Moody Bible Church in Chicago for many years. A great, great scholar of the Word of God. As I was studying this passage of Scripture, I looked in one of Theodore Epp's uh, commentaries, and he made this comment. He said, uh, uh, he said verse 7 uh, refers to the most climactic verses, is one of the most climactic verses in the, in the Word of God. And, and the reason he said that is because here's this action in heaven, and it says, then he came and took. It's one thing for the scroll to be there. It's one thing for Jesus to be willing and be qualified. But beloved, Jesus took the scroll out of his hand. When he took the scroll, he, or when he takes that scroll, he will set in motions things that God has had in his plan since the beginning of time. He will set in motion the beginning of eternity for us and set in motion the end of sin and the reign of Satan forever. I have to imagine that, you know, I, I love the following verses because what happened the minute he took that scroll out of the right hand of God uh, Immediately, all of heaven broke forth in, uh, in unhindered worship and praise before the Lord. And I have to imagine that Satan and all of his demons probably are going to reel in anguish at that time. As we kind of close this morning, I'm going to ask Josh and the praise team to come, and I want to kind of lead us in a, in a time of closing here with this word. There's so much in this chapter and you know actually you could probably take the fifth chapter and spend six or seven months in it but I'm going to do it all in one Sunday because I have the desire to move on I just want to ask you this question below if you're here this morning and you've given your heart to Jesus Christ uh, I've always I've always heard of redemption and salvation in three tenths he has redeemed us he did that at the cross he is redeeming us. He's interceding for us right now. And He will redeem us. And what we see here in chapter 5 is the final redemption. It's the final time when the Lord begins to break those seals and once and for all bring back what was lost because of sin. And not just bring part of it back, but bring it all back and to restore us to the place that God intended for us to be when He first created man and put us in that place. Let me ask you this morning as we close this time together. Let me ask you if you've trusted Jesus as your Savior. I always have to ask that question. I don't know. I shake your hands on Sunday morning. I look you in the eyes, and I can see the joy in the eyes of everyone that, whose hands I shake. But I don't know what's really going on in your heart. Only God can see that. Only He knows what's really taking place in your heart. I want to tell you this morning, if you've not trusted Christ as your Savior, He paid the price of redemption. It's already paid for. There's nothing else that you have to do. I'm always mindful of the thief on the cross. Because the thief on the cross had both of his hands nailed and his feet nailed to that cross. What could he do to earn his salvation? Nothing. The only thing he had done was rob people, break the law, and probably murder someone. Yet when he was on the cross, all he did was say, Lord, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. That's all he said. And the Lord knew his heart was turned over to him and he'd surrendered to him. And he, he promised him, this day you'll be with me in paradise. Beloved, that's all you have to do. You just have to turn your heart over to Him today because He's already redeemed you by His blood. And if you trust Him as your Savior, bow your head and just say, Lord, I pray that You'll save me. I pray that You'll forgive me and save me today. The Scripture says if you really mean it, He'll do it. Christians, I hope that this renews, can renew in your heart the things that we have to look forward to. Well, I'll tell you what, sometimes it gets pretty heavy down here. Sometimes it gets hard to carry on and continue on. But we've been given this revelation. That's why it's called the revelation. It means the unrolling, the unfolding, the revealing of things that will take place. I call this the love letter of Jesus Christ to His church. He loved us so much, He would not let time go by without revealing to us the things that are going to take place. These things are going to happen. They could start today. Are you sure in your heart? Do you know? That's what this time is for. We call it the invitation. It's a time when you can make that decision because I know the Holy Spirit speaks to all of our hearts. He's not silent. This is His time to speak. This is the day of grace. This is the time for the church to go out and the lost to go in by faith. 
Whatever's on your heart this morning, I just ask you to surrender it to the Lord today. Just give it all to Him, and He'll take care of it from there. Let me pray for us, and then we'll have this invitation. Father, I thank you for your word, and so grateful for this day and for all that you are. We thank you for the time that you've given us to come together. And Lord, I pray that I've been able to bring this message in such a way today to awaken our hearts and our thoughts to things that we really don't understand yet. We're just dependent on your Holy Spirit to show us as we read these things and study them. Lord, as, as best we can, we want to grasp hold and, and hang on to these things knowing that these days are yet before us. And we have so much that we need to do between now and heaven. Uh, you didn't save us so we could just become inactive and wait, but so that we could be about our master's business. I thank you now for this time, and as Josh and this team leads us in the time of invitation, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll do your good work in all of our hearts and that we'll make decisions in accordance with that work. We thank you now, and we give you the praise in Jesus' blessed name. Amen.